great devices. So. Terrific. David, I want to thank you very much for allowing us into your home uh, to talk to you so that you can help us understand some of the details about mouthpiece ventilation for our NEVAM website and on behalf of the uh, CanVent program. Uh, we very, very much appreciate you uh, allowing us to do this. Well, you're very welcome. The equipment has certainly uh, made it easier for me to live with this disease. When were you first uh, diagnosed with ALS? January 2012. And was it some time before you needed any ventilatory support? Yes. In about September, I started to um, feel short of breath in the mornings and wake up with a headache. That's when I came to see you. You recommended a BiPAP. We rented a BiPAP immediately, um, a Philips from a rental organization. Used that for a month, started to get used to the face mask. And then we got the uh, loader, which I think was a ResMed BiPAP from the uh, loader organization. How difficult was it for you to get used to it in the beginning? Well, I was using it only at night and um, using a mask that covers nose and mouth. And my face has quite a few contours, and I have a fairly bony nose. Lots of experience. So at the beginning, uh, we had to, uh, the, uh, there were some slight injuries in the nose and the cheeks, but we learned, or Joy learned, how to make pads and put them in the right places to avoid facial injuries. And uh, that was the only real problem. Um, there were some issues with leakage because I had to, uh, I was starting at a 19 centimeter pressure and at that pressure you've got to put the mask pretty tight on my face to avoid leakage. So that was an issue. But neither issues were difficult to solve. And we solved them in a couple of weeks. How long has it been that you've needed any kind of ventilatory support, night or day? But since then, since September of 2012. So that's... Uh Almost a year. Yeah. A year next month. And how many months now have you been using daytime support? I would say since late 2012. We came and see you, and in January of 2013, we got this trilogy equipment. And um, certainly since January 2013, I've been using it day and night. So we you would essentially be using it 24 hours a day. That's correct. And how long can you go without it? Well, I didn't know the answer to that question, because I've never tried. I can tell you this, we shower every morning together, and um, I go maybe five, 10 minutes without it. I'm very happy to get back on it. Today, as an experiment, I sat, and this was completely passive. I sat and used it. Uh, sorry, I sat and didn't use it for 15 minutes. By the end of the 15 minutes, my chest was really heaving and I was starting to cough. And I thought, that tells you that that's maybe my limit. Yeah, okay. How do you manage to swallow you know, liquids, solids, with the mouthpiece? Is it simply remove it? Uh, is it difficult at all? For a long time, I ate my meals with this device. I would simply get a few breaths, set it aside, take a few mouthfuls, and so on and so on. And that was okay. I never got uh, into any kind of breath deficit that way. That's no longer the case. Now I find it quite hard to eat with this device. I just can't get enough breath and eat in any reasonable time. So now I use a um, nose pillows, you have them behind you. I eat with them on, no problem. Okay. And do you breath stack or do lung volume recruitment with this mouthpiece apparatus? With this? No. You tend to do it with. I do it with a stacker with a balloon. bag? Yeah, and I only do that two or three times a day, frankly, to blow my nose. It helps you blow your nose? Oh, yeah. Does it do anything else for you? I, not that I'm aware of. Are you having any difficulties with speech or swallowing or saliva? 
None. So far, the ALS has not affected my head. I eat normally, I speak normally, I swallow normally. I have no accumulation of saliva, no choking, no phlegm, no nothing. And I think the point should be made that that's what makes you and others a perfect candidate, if you will, for non-invasive ventilation. What's your understanding of what often happens to other individuals with ALS who require ventilation 24 hours a day? I don't know. I'd be very curious to hear. Maybe you can tell me. Did we ever talk about a tracheostomy? No, because I, um, I categorically have, have, uh, have refused to consider that as an option. Okay. And, uh, that remains the case. Well, I, think I will it, not do that. I think it's important for folks to understand that the simple requirement for 24-hour ventilatory support does not necessarily require a tracheostomy and that you are a perfect example of an individual who can be supported 24 hours a day without one. I manage fine. Because there is a tremendous fear on the part of caregivers, uh, healthcare providers, that mouthpiece ventilation is not secure, uh, is not sufficient to provide safe life support. And uh, how, what would your opinion be about that? Well, I, a mouthpiece ventilation is only a small part of my, uh, of my ventilation. Usually during the daytime, I'm using no nasal pillows, and at nighttime I'm using a mask and or nasal pillows. One of them is talking, talking to people, having conversations. When we have guests, it's here, and I use this. I suspect that I am lucky in that my uh, mouth and uh, head muscles work well, so I think that helps me use this. And my hand works fine as well, so, so uh, that helps me use this device. Um, I use it to move around in the house. It's more convenient than having a, a full uh, a head mask of some kind attached to you. You can remove it, you can twist it, you can do all kinds of things. Um, I use it a lot watching television because uh, I don't have to turn the sound as high. Uh, it's much less um, noisy in your head. And, uh, what about reading? Do you need uh, corrective lenses? I, I need, yes. I, I, like, like Is any that easier with the mouthpiece? Makes no difference. Doesn't matter. No. You can wear the eyeglasses with the laser cushion. True. I use it in the bathroom in the morning because we move from place to place and have different tasks and different things need to be done and brushing teeth and stuff. So it's very convenient to, you know, you have it in your mouth or not have it in your mouth. And obviously, if you're going to be brushing your hair, you don't want to have a, a harness over your head. Are you aware of what happens to most individuals who require 24-hour ventilatory support and have ALS? No, I'm not, and I would very much like to know. There is a general concern in individuals who require more than, say, 12 or 14 hours of ventilation a day that non-invasive ventilation is not sufficiently secure, that everybody, including the physician, feels comfortable. And most individuals around the world would be treated, if they chose to, with a tracheostomy, because, simply because they're requiring more than 12 or 14 or more hours a day of ventilatory support. And there's a failure to recognize individuals who have sufficient bulbar function, control of speech and swallowing, the ability to hold a mouthpiece, who can manage 24-hour ventilation perfectly adequately and perfectly safely. And in fact, the risks may actually be considerably less than having a tracheostomy, where often there are risks, there are rehospitalizations, a number of complications, mm -hmm. potentially. It's true that it is more secure in a way. There are you know, alarms, the tracheostomy is attached directly to the tubing, and that's what makes people feel comfortable. But along with that comes considerable uh, risk, not to mention the initial surgery, the hospitalization, all that recovery, the ongoing risk. So, and of course, you're trapped by this thing, you're attached to it. 
Well, and imagine if at the point you required extensive hours of ventilation, somebody told you you can't do this. You have to have a tracheostomy. Imagine how long you now would have lived with a tracheostomy yeah. and the potential consequences. And it's been completely unnecessary. Yeah. Yeah. If I'm alone in my room, I always have two of these devices. The one next to my uh, chair that I'm using at the time, and this one here as a backup. So if one conks out, I'm perfectly capable of changing masks, turning one on, turning one off, doing all that stuff. And when so you fortunately, travel, I have that ability. When you travel, do you always take the resuscitation bag? Uh, I, don't, I don't know, do we? You should. David uh, doesn't travel. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't travel much. <laughs> That's something we, don't, we avoid. We travel with this thing. Yeah. Uh, so what is the ultimate prognosis for someone who is on full-time uh, full ventilation, non-invasive, and who does not, is not prepared to go, uh, have to go into, into the invasive uh, uh, method. How do, you, how do you know when you can't support yourself anymore? You know because you become increasingly incapable of holding the mouthpiece and sealing, or for that matter, being able to don a mask comfortably and effectively. As bulbar function declines and difficulty with saliva becomes a problem, a point comes when non-invasive ventilation is just not effective any longer. The upper airway is so closed and cumbersome that the ventilator is not capable of providing ventilation. But at the same time, most individuals find that their quality of life has declined to such an extent that they are essentially opting for palliative support through sure. symptom control. Fair enough. In my case, I have had no perceptible loss of bulbar function. My voice is a bit weak right now. That's because of, uh, mm -hmm. because of my chest function, not because of my bulbar function. Mm -hmm. If I'm wearing my nasal pillows, I can yell from one end of the house to the other, no problem. And I can, I can eat anything, swallow anything. I have no uh, flu, yeah. no coughing, no uh, issues of that kind. What is it? So this gadget, low leak, quite comfortable. I can eat, talk, whatever. Your voice Sleep. is no noticeably stronger. Yes, but right? stronger. I could fill the room <laughs> and sleep. David makes it sound easy, but actually he's gotten very good at coordinating it because he has to coordinate his eating and opening his mouth and everything with the breathing device and he's and talking. They used to burp a lot. Yes, I don't, uh, don't he anymore. did, and even spray sometimes water yeah. or something. Yeah, I think most very people would feel that the background, the, the EPAP, the background pressure would make it a bit more difficult to swallow without some degree of uh, difficulty and maybe even choking, but uh, it sounds like you've really managed I never all. choke, and um, they used to get a lot of gas and burp a lot, but that, that doesn't happen anymore. I think you get used to these things. Visit our website at www dot canventottawa dot ca for additional comprehensive information.